According to a legend from The Witcher, 60 women wearing gold crowns, born under solar eclipses, are prophesied to herald the return of Lilith, and with her will come the end of the world. These 60 women will be afflicted by something that became known as the Curse of the Black Sun. The first mentions of this curse came from the menhirs from the Dauk and the tombstones in the crypts of the Boskor, two presumably human civilizations, primitive, from the time between the conjunction of the spheres and the first landing. Long were these legends lost to humans. The stories of the Black Sun and Lilith's return only seem to be remembered by the Virbubs, a race of sentient human beaver hybrids. It wasn't until the research of a mage known as Altabald that the curse made its way back into the human cultures of the north. According to Altabald's translation and interpretation of the Dauk and Boskor, 60 crowned women born under the black sun would cause chaos in the north. I deciphered the warnings of the Dauk and the Boskor. Altabald would become concerned by his discovery and he devoted his life to studying the curse and those afflicted by it. When looking at those who are afflicted by the curse of the Black Sun, the most well-known and prominent character from The Witcher is Renfri, who I assume most will be familiar with due to her appearance in The Witcher TV show. But there are plenty of others that have been named. In Pooks we have Sylvana, the Lady of Narok. She managed to escape the hands of sorcerers like Elzebald and Stregobor due to her quick rise of influence in Narok where, according to Stregobor, terrible things were happening. There was a girl named Fjolka, not to be confused with Falka, who was locked up in a tower. She managed to escape using a homemade rope, and after her escape, she was set to terrorize the land north of Valhad. And then there was Bernika of Talgar. She would be freed from a tower by a prince, who would later be locked up in a dungeon, having lost his eyes. Gallows were set to fill Talgar, after her escape. These four are the only named girls from the books, but the games give us a few more. There was Deidre Aldemain, she was Eskol's child of surprise, also the one who was responsible for the scar on his face. Then we have Sylvia Anna, sister of Anna Henrietta, prominently featured in The Witcher 3's Blood and Wine expansion. And most recently we've gotten Maxi von Dekkar, a woman who hunted down mages around the time of Azur. So far, we know the identity of seven out of supposed 60 women that will mark Lilith's return. The books do mention that there have been plenty of others by the time Geralt faced off against Renfri. Once sorcerers like Altabald and Stregobor started their hunt for supposedly cursed women, they at first saw the cure for their affliction. They tried to use magic of both sorcerers and priests alike at various temples to exercise the curse from the girls. Unfortunately, all those who underwent this attempt for a cure died. The sorcerers who saw themselves as protectors against the Black Sun decided the failed attempts at curing women that they would be better off of killing them directly, as it would be less effort and had the same outcome. They did a few autopsies and one with a section, where they sought to affirm their claim that the girls were cursed and had been mutated. However, a bunch of wizards going around killing girls and women were born of noble blood, was probably not often liked by the families of those who were killed. Especially since Dragobor and his fellow sorcerers were not always sure if a girl was afflicted with the curse or not before ending their lives. And so they decided to do something different. Instead of killing them, they would isolate the girls by imprisoning them in towers. Geralt would refer to these towers as your famous towers in his conversation with Stregobor. However, similar to their previous attempts at preventing the girls from causing harm to others, the towers also proved not the desired result. As a number of girls escaped from their towers, among those were Fjalka and Bernica. Some of the girls escaped on their own, but a trend started, where young princes would go out to these towers to free the noble women inside. Many princes lost their lives, breaking their necks while attempting their rescue, but a few were successful as seen with Bernica of Talgar. But not all girls were lucky enough to escape. Many of them never made out of their towers. They would become apathetic and refuse to eat before they would pass away of hunger. All in all, probably dozens of girls have lost their lives at the hands of sorcerers who believed they were afflicted by the curse of the Black Sun. 
it is difficult to say how many cursed girls there have been. But so far, there have been less than 60, if the legend is to be believed. Any girl born into an ability during or a few days after a solar eclipse was placed inside a tower by the sorcerers. Not all of them, of course, were cursed. The sorcerers, who claim to be protectors against the cursed black sun, seem to believe that the curse is a real thing. They base their belief, partly, on the fact that those who were locked up in a tower would often show signs of clairvoyance before their death. During the autopsies of the deceased girls, it also finds some strange stuff, according to Stregobor, who said, What we found inside the skull and marrow could not be described. Some sort of red sponge. The internal organs were all mixed up. Some were missing completely. Everything was covered in moving cilia. Bluish, pink shreds. The heart was six-chambered, with two chambers practically atrophied. Of course, mutations happen often in The Witcher. Most of the time, due to the interference of sorcerers. And they definitely interfered with those girls and women. And even if the curse was real, that doesn't make them outright evil. Their organs being messed up and them having some slight magical powers doesn't mean they will kill everyone. It often comes down to the question of nature versus nurture. There are those afflicted by the curse, evil, out for blood because they want to kill, or are they evil and out for blood for being treated as an outcast, a monster and a freak their entire lives, to the point that they want to hurt those who are after them, and sometimes they become what people claim they are, due to the idea that they are not always normal, always being present in the back of their minds. Along with the question of if the curse made them evil, also comes the question if the curse is not merely a way for some sorcerers to control the kingdoms of the continent. They could lock up troublemaking women, which in turn would give them more control over noble and royal bloodlines. And who knows, perhaps if you've been acting against the interests of sorcerers, they might come and take away your daughter if she has been born around the solar eclipse. And nobility couldn't do much about the sorcerers taking their daughters due to the widespread fear of the curse amongst the common folk. They would see the sorcerers as heroes, and not the parents who want their children back. And it's not like only women born around the solar eclipse have been murderers and violent. There have been plenty of men as well who killed their entire families and plenty of innocent people. Nobility, if you look at the Middle Ages, was often inbred, and this could lead to an increased chance of some very mentally disturbed people. So far, there have been probably about 30 to 50 girls afflicted by the curse of the continent. It is difficult to give a precise number, but due to the words used in the book, it seems there have been a decent amount. Once this counter reaches 60, it is supposed to be the end of the world, and will mark the return of Lilith. The religion of Lilith herself has largely disappeared from the northern realms. Most of those who still worship her live to the east of Arcania and Haaklands, where she is known under the name Nia. What is interesting is that according to the Polish pen and paper RPG from the early 2000s, the belief in Lilith started to increase after the northern wars were over. There were men who believed that following her could spare them when she returns, and there were women and children who looked to her for protection after having gone through multiple wars. This leaves us with an increase in believers in the north and south alike, as well as the number of women getting presumably pretty close to 60 as prophesied. In The Witcher 3, Blood and Wine, Sianna's actions, direct and indirect, led to a lot of deaths in the otherwise peaceful valley of Toussaint. This is pure speculation, but perhaps in the upcoming trilogy of Witcher games, they might lean a bit more towards the curse of the Black Sun. Seeing how the current trilogy of Witcher games is mainly focused on the Wild Hunt, they could do something similar with the Black Sun. There are plenty of morally grey areas and choices they could explore. At the same time, Blood and Wine could also be seen as an introduction in the game world to what destruction and chaos these women would cause. If they decide to focus on the Black Sun, that would make Blood and Wine a way to transition from the story of Geralt to the story of a new Witcher that will follow in a new trilogy, where Sianna's story of the Black Sun can be seen as kind of a transition, maybe. But what are your thoughts on the curse of the Black Sun? Is the curse real? Does it result in murderous women? Or is it something that causes them to lash out? And will Lilith actually return once the continent reaches the 60th woman? Till the next video. Bye.